Could a holiday camp be used as a prison camp? Now that's a theme in my second book of the Exodus Play trilogy that's imprisoned. Some people said, well, that's hard to believe. Well, I'm here to tell you that truth is stranger than fiction, and now I'll tell you why. Holiday camps have many times been used as prison camps. Now before I go on, don't worry I'm giving you any spoilers, it's fairly obvious that that's the theme of this book. Look, you know, you can see on the cover, there's a holiday camp. So, uh, and in the, in the inside, I've even got a little map of it. So it's, it's from the outset, you know that that's the theme of this book. But let me tell you about the real life occurrences when that has happened. The first time that I'm aware of was in the First World War on the Isle of Man. Now I've got some notes here which I'm referring to because I want to make sure that I get this right. It was called the Cunningham's Holiday Camp. It was on the Isle of Man and it was used to house prisoners of war. It was not a, a very um, elaborate holiday camp as we might have now. I believe it was mainly tents. Well, in, later on, in, in the later decades of the 20th century, holiday camps started introducing chalets and swimming pools and entertainment and all sorts of other things. And that's the sort of holiday camp that I write about in Imprisoned. Now, in the Second World War, and again, I'm looking at my notes here to make sure I get it right, there was a Warner's holiday camp uh, in a place called Seaton, and uh, in King's Ash there was a Dixon's holiday camp. I've never even heard of, of Dixon's holiday camps. Uh, in Devon in Paynton, Th those were both used to house prisoners of war, uh, Italian and German and Austrian prisoners of war. The third one was in Clacton. Well, I went to Clacton when I was a kid. I was taken by my parents to this holiday camp. It was then a Butlin's holiday camp. Um, I believe it was owned by somebody else in the Second World War, but it was it was used to house prisoners of war. And I found an article in which somebody describes what it was like. At the, the well, this one is at the Seaton Holiday Camp, and this uh, prisoner said that the huts were unbearably cold, and there was a lack of food. Well, you know, the prisoner of war camp. What did they expect? I've never been so hungry in my life. This prisoner said. But in spite of that, they had entertainments. They had a German. A uh, full German band to play music. The German band had apparently been rescued from a cruise liner that went down to the bottom of the sea. So, in spite of the fact that they were prisoners of war, there were some elements of an actual holiday camp uh, still visible. Even more bizarre, and this is something, again, I, I didn't... I never heard of this when I was writing my, my uh, book, otherwise I might have used it, but uh, I've only recently discovered that in the 1980s, there was a sort of a theme park prisoner of war camp. That is, people could pay to go and pretend to be prisoners of war. And uh, this was prisoners of war of, of, of the Germans. And so it was a Nazi-style holiday, holiday camp, each to his own, um, in which people went to play the part of, of people that are captured by the Germans, and then they were watched over by guards and imprisoned by guards wearing SS uniforms. So. You know, if you think that uh, the, the plot in my book stretches credulity, that really happened. Now let me tell you, if you're not familiar with holiday camps, maybe you've never been to a holiday camp, it's a very British sort of thing in any case. And, you know, younger generations these days probably go abroad, they don't go to, to Butlins or Pontins was the other big holiday camp. Now, let me tell you a bit about them, because I, I said when I was a kid, I was taken to, to um, the Butlins at Clacton. And what would happen was, first of all, there would be this, this enclosed uh, area. I mean, it is like, you know, it's all fenced in. It's to prevent people getting in or out without going through the, the guards at the front gate. So it's, it's ready-made for an internment camp. So once you were in there, you'd spend your week in there, and all entertainments would be provided, the food would be provided, uh, there'd be a whole load of people wearing red coats in butlins, and if it was some other holiday camp, it would be different coloured coats, and those people would look after you, they'd see that you knew where you were going, and they'd also provide the uh, entertainment in the evening. They'd be singing, dancing, telling jokes, and so on. There would be a club for children, so I, in Butlins it was the Butlin Beavers Club, and you'd be given all sorts of, you know, I, I think I had a beaver-shaped money box uh, as, a, as a little gift, and then there'd be fancy dress contests, so I think I dressed up as a Martian, don't think I won, 
And for the adults, they'd also have these silly competitions. They'd be the knobbly knees contest. So all the dads would roll up their trousers and show off their knees and the one with the knobbliest knees would get a prize. And then there'd be a, a glamorous grannies contest where the, uh, the more mature women would uh, enter a competition to see how glamorous they were and so on and so forth. There'd be a swimming pool and a fairground and... Everyone would eat in, in this enormous dining area. You'd go for your breakfast, lots and lots of acres, it seems to me, acres of tables, and you'd all eat more or less the same thing. And even as a child, I thought this was, you know, it's a bit odd that you go somewhere and you are forced to have a good time. Everything there is, is organised to make you have a good time, whatever you feel like. Now, um... Yes, another thing that's worth mentioning is in the Second World War, some of the people that generally were prisoners of war actually tried to pretend, in a sense, that they were in a holiday camp. They'd put on their own entertainments. If you read any of the stories of prisoners of war of the Germans or uh, those who were caught by the Japanese, um, British and Australian troops, for example, caught by the Japanese, they would, in the most grueling and horrific conditions, they would put on shows. They'd have drag shows and all sorts of, of, of stuff. So this, this crossover between uh, holiday camp and prisoner of war camp or, or internment camp goes both ways. In Britain, there was, I think in the 1970s, a very popular TV programme called Heidi High, and it was all about a 1950s holiday camp. I think in, in there, the people wore yellow coats instead of red coats. But it portrayed for uh, that generation what fun a holiday camp could be. But not everybody saw holiday camps as that much fun. Joe Orton, who was a very well-known playwright in Britain in the 1960s, wrote a play called The Erpingham Camp. And that uh, showed a holiday camp that descends into all sorts of chaos and violence. So I don't know whether Joe Orton had been to a holiday camp and decided that he didn't really like it, but uh, that's another version of, of the holiday camp experience which shows the fine line between this uh, enforced jollity and um, the, the rather, I don't know, it's almost a dystopian view where everybody goes to be entertained en masse. One thing I, I discovered recently, which I didn't know, was that when he was a student at Cambridge, Prince Charles, yes, Prince Charles, played a part in a production of the Erpingham Camp. He played a priest, which just goes to show that truth really is stranger than fiction. <laughs>